Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Cash and Coffee. Steve here. It's Monday, the 8th of April, and it's the first full week of quarter two, 2024. And there's been a lot to digest over the weekend after a bump of non-farm payrolls in the US on Friday. Equity markets showed their true fickle nature after turning 180 degrees after Thursday's bearish tone to go full on bull on Friday, even though there's a risk that interest rate cuts in the US will now be delayed. And I'll run through all of this in the macro news session and take a stab at what I think may happen as we go through the rest of this week. In company news, we have Elon Musk arguing with Reuters, as well as setting a hard stop date for unveiling Tesla's new robo-taxi. We have Apple appealing to the US courts about import bans on their Apple Watch. We also have bad news for UK online grocery retailer Ocado, and also news of a very lucrative golden parachute for the outgoing CEO of Boeing. We have all the charts as normal, and in commodity news, I'll discuss the recent rise in the price of gold and whether we can expect some form of correction in the near future. In crypto news, I'm going to talk about this weekend's pump and dump in the cryptoverse and how this has affected Bitcoin and what may well happen as we go into the penultimate week before the Bitcoin halving event. Finally, there's thought for the day and a new company to cash and coffee, Alexander Older, with quite a deep quote, something to get your head around as you go through the day. Okay, before I jump in, I must say, as always, that none of this is financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor and everything I say today is purely my opinion. And of course, if you do like Cash and Coffee and you want me to continue doing these daily updates, then please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Just press the little watermark in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Any help you can give us is greatly appreciated. OK, straight on to macro news. And it's all about the US non-farm payroll numbers that were released on Friday. Well, I touched on this at the end of last week and said that the market expectation for March's non-farm payrolls was 200,000 new jobs. Moreover, I said that if the number was substantially over 200,000, then we may well see the market spooked again on the expectation that interest rate cuts in the US will now be delayed until quarter three. Well, the March non-farm payroll number came in at 303,000 new jobs. That's over a third more than was expected. And what's more, the previous two months were also updated by an increase in 22,000 new jobs. Furthermore, the unemployment rate surprisingly dropped to 3.8%. That's the 26th consecutive month under 4%. And that's not been seen since the 1960s. And in the context of inflation, this is not good. The more people that are employed, the more money people have. And the more money people have, the more they spend. And of course, the more people spend, the more likelihood that inflation will either stay as it is or rise. And you can see from the chart on the screen that the US payroll numbers seem to be turning back in the wrong direction. The dotted line is the average monthly payroll numbers from 2010 to 2019, when inflation was steady around the Fed target of 2%. And you can also see that the actual monthly payroll number in the orange line and the average in the red line have been coming down slowly since interest rates have been at their current levels. However, since the start of 2024, the average seems to be turning back up which could indicate an uptick in inflation as we go through the coming months. That said, it's not all bad. There are a number of other metrics that the Fed considers when it comes down to interest rates, and these include average earnings and also the number of jobs that are available compared to the number of people that are available to work. And if I look at the former, you can see that although the number of people in work has risen in the US, average earnings, the amount people are paid, has reduced and is getting closer to the blue area. And the blue area is the typical average earnings when inflation has been held at around about 2%, again, the Fed target. And if I look at the job seekers metric, you can see that although there is still more jobs available compared to those seeking work, the number is decreasing close to the desired one for one level. And these two metrics suggest that although the number of new jobs that are being created is higher than expected, those sorts of jobs are lower paid jobs, and also that some people may be taking on more than one job. And these two factors themselves don't necessarily mean an increase in inflation. So with this in mind, how was the jobs report viewed by the Fed and the markets? Well, the Fed was very dovish and headlines whizzed across the airways like the following. Strong US labor market underpins economy in first quarter and upside inflation risks keep Fed officials wary of turn to rate cuts. And Fed speakers continued their dovish tone from the previous day. Richmond Federal President, who we heard from on Thursday, stated the following. This is quite a strong jobs report. And Dallas Federal President Laurie Logan reaffirmed this, stating, I believe it's much too soon to think about cutting interest rates. And Federal Governor Michelle Bowman was more descriptive in her position, stating, 
We are still not yet at the point where it is appropriate to lower the policy rate. And I continue to see a number of upside risks to inflation. And although it will eventually become appropriate to gradually lower the federal funds rate to prevent monetary policy from becoming overly restrictive, and while it is not my baseline outlook, I continue to see the risk that at a future meeting we may need to increase the policy rate further should progress on inflation stall or even reverse. So, with a high payrolls number, dovish Fed speakers, the expectation of interest rates now moving out into Q3, and that 1% drop in the equity markets that we experienced on Thursday, one would have thought on Friday the dollar would rocket and the equity markets would crash. Well, apparently not. If I turn to the charts and look at the dollar index, the DXY first, you can see that after an initial spike, the index closed pretty much on a par with Thursday, with Thursday itself on a par with where the markets closed on Wednesday. And this was reflected in the British pound and the euro. You can see here that the pound was flat on the day after the initial drop closing the week at 1.264. And the euro did the same closing at 108.4. As for the US equity indices, well, the S&P 500 closed up on the day 1.1% at 52.04. But note that it was still down on the week, just over 1%. The Dow Jones was up almost a percent on the day, closing at 38.904, but also down on the week over 2%. The Nasdaq 100 was up 1.3%, and that could have been a lot more if it wasn't for Tesla, which I'll come to shortly. The tech index closed at 18,108. Finally, we have the VIX, and the fear index cracked a smile on the day, dropping down to 16.03. In terms of major winners, you can see GE Aerospace was the S&P 500 leader, up 6.05% on the back of its listing split from GE Energy. Amazon led the charge on the Dow Jones, up 2.8%. And Constellation Energy was the winner on the Nasdaq 100, up 5.44% on the day. Finally, in terms of US equities, we see this week the start of the earnings seasons, and this kicks off with the banks. As you can see, we have JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, BlackRock, and Citigroup all reporting through this week. If I now turn to UK equities, we will see that the UK did not quite have enough time to hang on to the coattails of their counterparts in the US. The FTSE 100 closed down 0.8% at 79.11, but it was good to see that the retracement was capped at around the double top area. The FTSE 250 was down a similar amount of 0.74%, closing at 19.725, and the AMR share 0.34% at 744. If we turn to the major rises, we can see that from a large cap standpoint, there were limited high rises with Futter Entertainment, the company behind betting sites such as Paddy Power. PokerStars and Betfell was leading the charge up 1.15%. What was noticeable, however, was Ocado leading the fallers down 9% on the day, on the back of a potential conflict the company may have with its shareholders, with the board wanting to reward Ocado's current boss, Tim Steiner, with a £15 million windfall. Finally, in terms of earning announcements in the UK, the two big names that stand out this week are JD Sports and Tesco, who both released their financials on Tuesday and Wednesday, respectively. OK, before we move off equities, let's just have a quick look at how Asia is sitting at the moment and also what the European and US futures are like at around about 5 a.m. UK time. Uh, and you can see that the ASX in Australia is flat at 0 0.07, uh, New Zealand half a percent down. Um, China, uh, both in terms of Shanghai and Hong Kong, they're just a little bit down on the day. Uh, the Nifty in India is up 0.3%, and the big riser at the moment is Japan, uh, the Nikkei 225 at 0.87%. But you remember from last week that they had a big drop in Japan um, throughout last week, so this is probably just a little bit of a correction from there. In terms of futures, it's very early days at the moment. Monday morning, you don't get a lot of action until very close to the markets being open. And as you can see, this is reflected here with all major indices just flat. Um, a little bit of green in Europe uh, and red in North America. But again, in terms of percentages, they're pretty much at the same as the close on Friday. OK, before I move on to company news, it's worth just noting the major macro news that's going to be released this week. And the standout item is the US CPI or the US inflation numbers that are going to be released at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday. We also have interest rate decisions from the Canadian Central Bank and also the ECB on Wednesday and Thursday, respectively. OK, if I now turn to company news, the major news item that seems to have been across all the headlines over the weekend was a dispute between Elon Musk and Reuters, with Reuters releasing an article alleging that Tesla is to scrap its low-cost car plan amid fierce competition. Although in the UK's Daily Telegraph, this was refuted, with the broadsheet reporting that Musk had denied this. And you can see evidence of this in Musk's message on X, where Musk accused Reuters of lying again. 
Now, whatever the truth is, the markets didn't like this news. Tesla's share price dropped 3.63% on the day, although you can see some recovery through aftermarket trading. In addition to this low-cost car news, Musk has also announced that Tesla will unveil its much-awaited robo-taxi on August the 8th. But if you scan the net, you'll notice that there's a lot of scepticism about what this unveiling will mean, with a general consensus that a driverless taxi is some years away yet. In other company news, we have Apple, who have urged a U.S. appeals court on Friday to overturn a U.S. trade tribunal's decision to ban imports of some of Apple's watches in a patent dispute with the medical monitoring technology company Massimo, with Apple saying that Massimo's claims have no substantiated facts behind them. Finally, in company news, we have a report that rewarding failure is not off the table when it comes down to Boeing, with the outgoing Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun receiving his 2023 compensation package at an alleged increase of around 45% versus the previous year to total just under $33 million. Okay, so let's move on and close off on the charts and turn to commodities and first of all gold. And in terms of gold, you can see that ignoring the roller coaster ride of the equity markets, gold ended the week at another all time high, closing at $2,329 per ounce. Now, for those of you who have seen this week's edition of Weekend Markets, if you haven't, there's a link somewhere above me. But for those of you who have seen this, you'll know that I've put a case forward that suggests there may well be a retracement in the gold price sometime in the near future. Not only is gold's RSI showing overbought, we may well be in for a US dollar bull run in the short term. If interest rate expectations in the US are moved out to quarter three, then it's quite possible that we will see the dollar rise, especially if we see the ECB cut rates at their meeting either May or June. And if this does occur, we may well see a short-term correction in the price of gold. What will be interesting indicators this week is the inflation numbers coming out of the US and what the ECB says after its interest rate decision. OK, turning to oil, you can see that at the end of the week, it was relatively quiet for oil. It closed Friday, as it did on Thursday, at $86.70 per barrel. Copper was similar with a slight rise, and US futures closed in the week at $42.36. OK, turning over to lithium, we can see the SC6, or spodumene concentrate 6, into China has risen by uh, $3. Uh, and the current rate is $1,138 per tonne into China. OK, last but by no means least, the cryptoverse. And if I look at the Bitcoin four hour chart, you can see that as we went through Sunday evening around the world, Bitcoin pumped a little, going back above $70,000. It's corrected a little bit now, back into the low 69s. Um, but you would expect as we go through the next week or so, this is the penultimate week before the Bitcoin halving currently planned or scheduled for uh, April the 20th. You might see some additional volatility. And as we go past the halving, we expect to see Bitcoin slowly but surely rise as we go through the coming months. And as we get into next week and we get closer to the halving event, I may well do a little bit more of analysis on halving, what it actually is, and just explain to people what's going to happen as we go through the back end of this month and into the rest of the summer period. OK, with the charts done, that's almost it for this edition of Cash and Coffee. The last thing we've got to go through is store for the day. And today is Alexander Elder. An elder is a strange breed. He's a Russian-American currently residing in America. He's a professional trader and investor. He's also a qualified psychiatrist, and he's made a number of valuable contributions to the investment and trading world. An elder is probably the best known for two books that he's released. The first one has been used around many, many trading floors, and that's called Trading for a Living. That was released in 1993. He also released a sequel, and that sequel was called My Trading Room. I've read the former, but I've not read the latter, and I would certainly recommend the former. And I've added a link to both of these books in the description. And one of Alexander Elder's most interesting quotes is the following. The goal of a successful trader is to make the best trades. Money is secondary. And although this is a little bit cryptic, what Elder is saying here is that what professional traders are looking for is volatility, not necessarily the asset. They trade the volatility in the market, whatever the asset may be. If you find and trade volatility in a particular market or an asset with a good risk reward ratio, then ultimately money should result. OK, on that note, I should bid you farewell. I hope you enjoy this episode of Cash and Coffee. It's the start of the new week. We'll have Cash and Coffee all through this week. And I said before, if you do like these videos, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. But in the meantime, thanks for watching and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye.